producing tiny aerosolized particles less than five microns in diameter of respirable size to land in the terminal bronchi. A few years after they used this, quotes, ordinance, pediatricians noticed an increased incidence of, of childhood cancer. It has now gone up 700%. And because of the sanctions uh, and the war, they can't treat the patients, and the patients die untreated. The incidence of severe anomalies like cyclops, anencephaly, phocomelia, and the like has gone up, gone up 700%. Women are too terrified to deliver their babies for fear of what will appear, and the doctors have told the women to stop having babies. In the cradle of civilization where arithmetic began, law began, writing began between the Euphrates and Tigris River, we have contaminated this area for the rest of time. They're using it in Afghanistan and it's probably our uranium. Is there anything in the newspapers about this? No, it's all about Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard and talking about God knows what. But nothing important and imperative to the future of the human race. Um, Okay, and this is good stuff because it's free, because it's radioactive waste. Then, oh, and they've used over 2,000 tonnes now. George II, he used it in Baghdad. There are 5 million people in Baghdad, half of whom are children, extremely radiosensitive. I, as a paediatrician, am deeply concerned about those children. Now, when uranium is mined, it's crushed into tiny little, very fine particles. And the nuclear industry consistently says uranium, right, is sustainable. I mean, nuclear power, clean, green. And they lie. Um, at least the generals didn't lie when I debated with them about nuclear war because they kind of knew a nuclear bomb dropping on New York would vaporize practically all the people. But the nuclear industry lies. In fact, huge amounts of fossil fuel are used to mine the uranium. Just go to Olympic Dam, watch them. Trucks about as big as this room. Then to crush the ore, we use brown coal generated in South Australia. Huge amounts of CO2. And then when the ore is crushed, it's called yellow cake, and it's transported by rail on a railway line built by Halliburton, and the CEO of Halliburton was Dick Cheney, who is a sociopath. <laughs> and I'm going to write a book about him. <laughs> and Rumsfeld. And it's going to call what, be called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them, because I want to understand the etiology. And I think it's, the etiology is... Uh, located in the reptilian midbrain of some of these men who have a toxic reaction to testosterone. <laughs> anyway, so when the uranium is crushed, it's taken to Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, so that's where our uranium goes. And it's turned into uranium hexafluoride, which is a gas, which is passed through literally half a mile of nickel filters, tiny little holes. And you force the gas through on one side, it stays 238, the other 235. And so over a series of cascades, you end up with 3% 235 to use in reactors. Um, so this is very energy consuming. So in America, they use two 1,500 megawatt coal fire plants to enrich the uranium. And they also use a lot of H uh, CFC gas which is banned under the Montreal Protocol, as we know, because we're all getting melanomas and squamous and basal cell carcinomas from the UV radiation. Um, but they've been, quote, grandfathered out of the Montreal Protocol, and 93% of the CFC gas in America leaks from the Paducah, Kentucky uranium enrichment plant, and it's 10,000 to 20,000 times more potent as a heat trapper than CO2. But don't forget, nuclear power does not produce global warming according to Ziggy Switkowski. And he's Polish like I am, and I really despise the man. My name's, my name's actually Bronowski. Anyway, so that when it's enriched at great energy expense, it is then converted to little pellets like chalk, ceramic pellets, which are placed in long fuel rods, half an inch long, 12 feet long, made of zirconium. Um, and they take along 100 tonnes of uranium to the reactor core and they pack it into the core, 100 tonnes, like that, and immerse it in water. And there are moderating rods of boron which moderate the flux of neutrons. And as they're slowly removed, the neutrons start breaking apart in a random fashion the heavy uranium atoms producing 200 new isotopes 
all of which are man-made and never existed before we fissioned uranium in order to make nuclear weapons. This creates tremendous heat of the type E equals MC squared. So we've captured the energy of the sun in these reactors. And the heat boils the water. When the water boils, the steam's taken off, which turns a turbine, which generates electricity. So all a nuclear power plant is designed to do is to boil water. It's like cutting a pound of butter with a chainsaw. And as Einstein said, nuclear power's a hell of a way to boil water. And when the first bomb blew up, named Trinity, after the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the desert, fancy calling a nuclear weapon Trinity, there was an outside possibility, according to physicists, that the whole atmosphere could be rendered critical and we would be enveloped in one nuclear explosion. And they were actually in their um, trenches, the physicists, taking bets as to whether that would happen. If the bomb hadn't worked, the telegram to the president was to read, it's a girl. So there's been sexism, profound sexism, in the nuclear industry and language ever since the beginning. The telegram telesent said, it's a boy. And as Oppenheimer watched the bomb blow up, he realized what he'd captured the energy of the stars, and he said, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds, from the Bhagavad Gita. And he said, for the first time, physicists have known sin, and they've been sinning ever since, and we let them, because we're the ones who actually know physiologically what all this means. Anyway, each reactor needs a million gallons of water to keep it cool. And if you lose the power supply, as they did at Fukushima because of the earthquake, you can't keep the pumps running. So underneath at Fukushima, they had huge diesel generators the size of a house. But then in came the tsunami, the tidal wave, and it damaged these things, and so they couldn't circulate the water. The heat of these fission products, the intrinsic heat, is so intense that what happens is the uranium melts. And within 24 hours, three reactors, unit one, two and three melted through the, through the reactor vessel, which is six inches thick of solid steel, onto the bottom of the containment floor. At the same time, zirconium at 1,500 degrees centigrade reacts with um, water to form hydrogen. And there was a valve to let hydrogen out if this happened so it wouldn't explode that, like the Hindenburg. But to do it, open it, you had to turn, a man had to turn it a hundred times and it was so radioactive they couldn't get there. So hydrogen built up and there was a massive hydrogen explosion actually in three reactors and four cooling pools, like the Hindenburg, which broke the containment vessel and allowed radioactive isotopes to leak out. The Japanese government didn't tell their people for three months that there'd been a meltdown. Now that's evil. And they also had a special thing to monitor the radiation going in various areas, but they didn't tell the people so they could escape because they didn't want to, A, cause panic, or you mustn't cause panic in a population like cry, crying fire in a crowded theatre. That's antithetical to good PR and, you know, whatever. Um, and they didn't want to get into trouble if they were wrong. And the Japanese... I really, it's this sort of feudalistic society of ring bars and says they're sorry when they're really not. And the women don't do much, you know, but the women are really rising up now because their kids are living in highly radioactive areas. Um, this uranium becomes one billion times more radioactive when it's fissioned. One billion times. And in each reactor is as much long-lived radiation as that produced by a thousand Hiroshima-sized bombs. So the radiation we're dealing with is intense. And then uh, on the top of the reactors are what are called swimming pools, euphemistically. They're the cooling pools where they take 30 tonnes of uranium out every year that's so packed with isotopes. It's so radioactive. And they're stacking them here. So there's much more radiation in the cooling pools than there is in the reactor themselves, and they all, had, uh, they all had explosions as well. It's antithetical to put cooling pools on the roofs of reactors, especially unit number four had just had all its fuel removed and placed in its cooling pool, so it's fresh, highly hot, highly radioactive fuel. If you stand next to one fuel rod for a couple of seconds, the gamma radiation being emitted will kill you within days. 
That's how hot it is, and thermally hot as well. So they must be continually cooled, and if they're not, they too have hydrogen explosions and melt down. So unit four, most of the, all of the fuel is in the fuel pool on top of a building that has been seriously damaged by an earthquake. Now, we all know there are aftershocks, and there continue to be aftershocks. And if there's a major earthquake, three things can happen. Cooling pool, the number, unit number four will collapse. And if that collapses, I've got a family with young grandchildren in Boston. I'm flying them out straight away to Australia because the two air masses do not mix at the equator. So the fallout is only occurring up there. However, they've poured terra becquerels, trillions of becquerels into the Pacific Ocean. And fish bioconcentrate radiation like the algae bioconcentrated by orders of magnitude, crustaceans, little fish, big fish, and then us. And you can't taste in a salmon or a trout or whatever grows in the ocean radiation. You can't say, I can taste the cesium in this fish. Shucks. Um, and fish swim thousands of miles and currents go all around, especially in the Pacific, and we could easily be catching radioactive fish. The EPA in, in America, in its wisdom, has stopped testing the fish being caught, and they're not testing a fallout in America, and there's been a lot of fallout. Now, I'll just walk you through four of the elements, knowing that there are 200. Uh, some last seconds, and, and I-129, for instance, has half-life of 17 million years, to give you an idea. So let's do I-131 first. You don't, I mean, you know about that, don't you? Its half-life is eight days. It's around for about 10 weeks. And that's why they parted the milk at Hershey's and used the milk for the chocolates. And you all know it's a, it's a gamma, and you know it's a beta, and it's very carcinogenic, particularly in children. And baby thyroids suck it up like little sponges, particularly fetuses. So they can be born as cretins. And in fact, in the Chernobyl, there are a lot of uh, cretin, cretin babies and babies with microcephaly because the developing brain is very sensitive to radiation. Then there's strontium-90. Uh, strontium-90 is a calcium metal -like, like radium, goes to bone, beta and gamma, uh, half-life 30 years. So it's around for 600 years. Europe's covered with it. Cesium-137 is a potassium analog, so it causes brain tumors, rhabdomyosarcomas, it goes to testicles and ovaries where it's carcinogenic and mutates genes in the sperm and eggs. Half-life 28 years, so it's around 600. Now, much of Europe is covered with cesium-137, 40% of the land mass. I'm going to Turkey soon. Turkey got such a hell of a fallout from Chernobyl, they picked the radioactive tea, they drink a lot of tea in Turkey, and they sent it to Russia, just to serve them right. But if you go into our health food shops, yeah, they're full of Turkish dried apricots, Turkish hazelnuts, Turkish dried tomatoes. Where are our lovely... Ditters, you know, dried apricots from South Australia. I said to my man in the health food shop, are these apricots radioactive? He said, well, they're organic. <laughs> All food's organic anyway, so that's a stupid term for food. Stupid. All food's organic. But so I rang the man in Melbourne who tests the food coming in from Turkey and Europe. And I said, how do you test it? He said, well, we pick up random spot checks. And I said, well, how do you pick out which batches to check? Oh, he said, the computer does. And I said, well, what do you do when you find radioactive food? He said, we dilute it with non-radioactive food. The solution to pollution by dilution when it comes to radiation is fallacious because it reconcentrates back in the food chain and in our bodies. So you don't know if you're eating radioactive food. I look terribly carefully at the labels of the food. When I buy you, we can buy great... Um, um, olive oil in Australia, everything. We should be exporting non-radioactive food to a radioactive Europe. And not, ex we've got to stop exporting uranium. And that means you and me. Because we understand and we've got to educate people, including Tony Abbott, who Penny kind of knows. Apparently he's quite a decent man one to one. But he's not, you know, anyway, I won't go into that. 
There are rats, there are wild boars in Germany so radioactive and full of cesium because they eat the truffles and the mushrooms that concentrate cesium, they almost glow in the dark. There are 360 farms in Cumbria and Wales whose lambs are so chock-a-block full of cesium-137, they have to close the farms down. And the government said you've got to close them down for about 100 years. No, it's not. It's 600 years. <laughs>